Let's turn, brethren, to uh, Psalm 32. That's uh, where we're taking our text from this evening, Psalm 32. And we read the 11 uh, verses of uh, that psalm. Our text this evening is the verses 3 through 5 of this psalm. Notice that it's a a psalm of David. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night my hand was heavy upon me, My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Again, our prayers that the Lord would open our eyes to what he uh, says to us there in his word. Those verses then, 3 through 5 of Psalm 32. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old uh, through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. The psalm or our text commences when I kept silence. Silence in some circumstances is considered a virtue. In other words, it's a quality that is to be desired. Silence as a virtue is reflected in the well-known saying, silence is golden. That saying arises from the idea that at times to be quiet, to say nothing, and to listen to what someone else has to say can be of immense value or benefit. But not all silence is a virtue. There is a silence that is indicative of serious spiritual problems. That is the stubborn silence of unacknowledged, unconfessed sin. And such silence is not a virtue, but it's a matter that requires remedial spiritual action. Psalm 32 concerns a period of such silence in the life of David, King of Israel. Psalm 32 is a penitential psalm and as such it concerns sorrow over sin. Sorrow that leads to confession of sin. And finally it concerns God's forgiveness of the repentant sinner and the relief that comes with the knowledge of such forgiveness. 
Notice how the psalm starts in a way that's where we find the real purpose and the central idea of the psalm. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The historical background to this psalm is what we read in Second Samuel 11 and 12 this evening. I don't think you can read that passage of the Word of God and not have a sense of the pain that is evident in that historical background. The conduct of David recorded there in first in second samuel 11 and 12 is despicable it involved behavior that was highly offensive to the lord a conduct unworthy of a man uh, after god's own heart uh, that of course is a description of david david was a man after God's own heart. But David sinned greatly. The conduct, of course, that David uh, was involved, with, involved in uh, concerned the sins of adultery and murder. His adultery was with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And the murder of Uriah, as David attempted to conceal his uh, uh, infidelity with uh, Bathsheba is uh, very much to the fore even here in Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is a psalm of David, psalm of David the guilty but repentant sinner. In the psalm David confesses his sins and expresses his deep regret and profound sorrow over his sins. It sees David turning away from his sins and turning unto the Lord in the way of genuine confession and repentance. Uh, David has come to know and experience the forgiveness of the Lord. But as he reveals in this psalm, regret, sorrow and confession uh, had not always flowed from his mouth. Certainly had not flowed from his mouth uh, immediately upon the commission of his sins. Indeed, there was a lengthy period of David's life uh, when he actually failed to face up to his sins. However, Psalm 32 finds David having been humbled by the Lord and brought to his spiritual senses. And this psalm describes a man who has been confronted with his sins and who now openly and shamefacedly confesses those sins and turns from them unto the Lord. The necessity of confession and repentance of sin is highlighted in our Westminster Confession of Faith uh, which uh, in dealing with the subject of repentance has this to say, repentance is an evangelical grace. By it, a sinner out of the sight and sense not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins, as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God, and upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ to such as a penitent, so grieves for and hates his sins as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavouring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. Brethren, what this indicates and what this passage of the word of God indicates to us is this, uh, we may not be indifferent to our sins. Like David, we must acknowledge and confess our sins. The reality is that we are all sinners. Uh, but the tendency even for 
uh, those who have been redeemed even by the blood of Jesus Christ at times is to be very cavalier about their sins and to simply pass on as though our sins don't require uh, much attention. No one sees, no one knows, and so we just simply move on uh, without genuine acknowledgement, confession, and turning uh, from our sins. But here, brethren, we are confronted with the reality that we need to actually sorrow and grieve over our sins. Uh, we must not trivialise or trivialise or minimise our sins, but we must face them, we must confess them, and we must turn uh, from those sins. Indeed, we must come with broken and contrite hearts to the Lord, acknowledging our sins and expressing our sorrow over them and by his grace uh, walking in obedience to his word. Confession and repentance are of such importance in the Christian life that apart from them we will never know peace with God. So we'll look at this word of God this evening under this theme, acknowledging our sins. Firstly, the sinful silence. Secondly, the heartfelt confession. And then finally, the genuine forgiveness. The sins of David involving Bathsheba and Uriah they were flagrant violations of the law of God. There's no other way to describe the conduct of David. He engaged in flagrant violations of the law of God. When reading the account in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, it is impossible not to be struck by the outrageous nature and gravity of David's sins. Uh, they rightly engender a sense of revulsion. What David did was abhorrent. His conduct amounted to not just one, but to multiple breaches of the law of God. It's not as though he simply stole or lied so that restoration could be made or compensation given. But he destroyed his neighbour's marriage and family in the vilest possible manner. He committed adultery with his neighbour's wife. He lured Bathsheba into that sin. And then when that self-indulgent tryst led to her pregnancy, he sought to cover up his sin. He sought to cover up his sin by enticing Uriah uh, to go in unto his wife. Uh, firstly, he provided him with uh, food and meat so that he would return home. When that didn't work, uh, he in fact uh, made him drunk uh, with a view that he might then return to his home. And through his uh, returning home, the uh, sin of David would be in fact uh, covered when his attempts at subterfuge were thwarted by, in fact, and in fact, sadly, the integrity of Uriah, uh, when those attempts at subterfuge were thwarted by the integrity of Uriah, uh, David then orchestrated the death of that valiant man. No matter how David's conduct is viewed, it amounted to uh, egregious violations of both the sixth and the seventh commandment of God's law. David not only lusted after Bathsheba and committed adultery with her, but he consciously and deliberately engineered the death of Uriah, all with the intent that his own sin uh, should remain hidden. What made David's sins even more outrageous was that he committed them publicly. Uh, the account in Second Samuel uh, indicates that many in Israel were actually aware of his sin. And to a significant degree, uh, he made many around him complicit in his sin. He involved his servants in the pursuit of his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. Second Samuel 11 and verse 3, And David sent and inquired uh, 
after the woman. And then you read it again in verse uh, 4. And David sent messengers and took her. And furthermore, he engaged the assistance of Joab to facilitate the murder of Uriah. His command to Joab, the captain of his army, concerning Uriah was, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And uh, David's spiritual sensibility was at such a low ebb that he even had Uriah carry the letter to Joab that contained his death warrant. Nathan the prophet highlighted the public nature and significance of David's sins when he declared that David had given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The gravity of David's sins is further heightened when it's appreciated that he committed these sins at a time when he was the king of Israel. And as king, he had been appointed by God uh, to rule over and lead his people. As king, it was his calling to set an example before the people. He was responsible for upholding the law of God. He was responsible to lead and guide the people in the way of truth. It was his calling to lead the people in the paths of righteousness. David committed his sins in his kingly office and actually in the exercise of his office. He could not have done what he did if he had not been the king of Israel. And by his actions, he abused the trust that the Lord had placed in him. He abused his office. He used the power and privileges of his office to facilitate his sins. He did that when he should have, in fact, been leading Israel into battle. But instead of leading Israel into battle, we find that David was languishing in Jerusalem and indulging his lusts. And David's sins were further aggravated by the fact that he was a regenerated, redeemed child of God. Now it's true that the ungodly commit many outrageous sins. At times the world staggers under the brutality and the cruelty of many sins that we hear being perpetrated around the world. Some sins are perpetrated in the vilest and most depraved of ways. So much so the words are actually incapable of adequately expressing the revulsion that some sins uh, deserve. As the psalmist declares in Psalm 119, rivers of waters run down mine eyes because wicked men keep not thy law. The sins of the ungodly are rightly deplored, but the sins of those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ are consequently even more reprehensible. But David knew better. At the time that David engaged in these sins, he knew and in fact had experienced the grace of God. He was one upon whom the love of God had been bestowed. He was one in whom the Lord had dwelt by his spirit. The spirit of God was at work in the heart of David. And as such, he should have been a beacon of light in the midst of a dark world. But in his dealings with Bathsheba and Uriah, David was far from a beacon of light. He did despite to the spirit of grace. He sinned against knowledge. He was like the dog that returns to its vomit or the uh, washed sow that returns to wallow again in the filth of the mire. Even to the natural man, David's sins uh, were appalling. There was something more that served to increase still yet the gravity of David's sins. 
what especially made David's sins to be so reprehensible before the Lord was his impenitence. For a lengthy period of time, David refused to confront his sins. He refused to acknowledge and confess those sins. And his failure to do so served only to aggravate his sins. David's reference to his impenitence is to be found in those words that begin, verse 3, when I kept silence. By silence here, David is not referring to his speech. It's, it was not that David was actually unable to speak, but rather he was silent with respect to the confession of his sins. In other words, he failed to openly confess and acknowledge his sins. He did not come before the Lord in prayer and shamefacedly confess his sins. Instead, he kept those sins hidden. He suppressed his conscience. And so he went on uh, without addressing his sins, as though all, in fact, was well. David confirms that that was what he had done when in verse 5 we read, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the law, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. As implied by those statements, there was a time when David did not acknowledge his sins, and when he did not confess his transgressions. In fact, there was a period of time when David hid his iniquity. It should be appreciated that David's silence, that is, his lack of acknowledgement and confession of his sins, uh, did not arise out of ignorance. David was well aware of his sins. It is true, brethren, at times we can commit sins of which we are unaware the psalmist in Psalm 139 and verses 23, 24 uh, indicates that when we, re we read there, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. But that was not the case with David. David was not ignorant of his sin. David well knew the uh, nature and the awfulness of his sins. His problem was that though fully aware of his sins, he actually refused to acknowledge them before the Lord. He was unwilling to confess his sins. He engaged in self-denial and self-justification. Instead of bowing before the word of God, David attempted to press on as though he had actually done nothing that was wrong. Second Samuel chapter 12 suggests that his impenitence continued for a period in the order of some 12 months. We note that it was not until after the birth of Bathsheba's son when Nathan came and declared to David, Thou art the man, that David was brought to acknowledge his sins. It was only then that David was brought uh, to confess his sins. So in Second Samuel 12 verse 13, he openly confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. Before that time, David had not made such a confession. He had not acknowledged that he had actually sinned against the Lord. Brethren, who of us, who of us, have also not walked down that same path? Too often our response to our sins is the same as David's. Too often we are actually aware of our sins but steadfastly press on, not acknowledge them, not acknowledging them. Perhaps we view them as being too small, too insignificant, uh, not worthy of uh, continued uh, uh, concern but rather we just simply go on we refuse to confess our sins. Sometimes it is perhaps someone even admonishes us about our sins, perhaps a friend, perhaps our husband, our wife, 
but we don't want to hear it. Instead, we adroitly brush off the admonition and simply continue on as though nothing is in fact wrong. Perhaps we put off uh, the consideration of our sins. Another day, another time, but not now. Perhaps uh, we have all manner of explanation as to why it's not necessary for us uh, to address those sins. We're full of justifications, excuses. What sins, we say? Was that really a sin? There are even times when the Lord brings his word and that word uh, touches upon our conduct, upon our lives, upon our sins, even it does as it does this evening. And through uh, perhaps the preaching of the word, the Lord pricks our consciences. Yet how easily we conclude that what is said is a word for everyone else but not for ourselves. With the result that we meet the pricking of our consciences with the time-honoured and tested defences. The uh, time-honoured and tested defence of deflection. We uh, say to ourselves, well, that's certainly what others need to hear. That's a message for them, but it's not a message for me. Or perhaps we use that uh, other time-honoured and tested defence of indifference and obfuscation. That is, we say to ourselves, this is not relevant to me. I don't have sin. I don't need to confess any sin. Or perhaps we use that defence of self-justification. That what I did was necessary. It had to be done. Those things needed to be said. And so we actually justify our conduct. And that way, the word of God here becomes a word for everyone else, but not for ourselves. And like David, perhaps we forthrightly render judgment upon the conduct of others. We say, along with David, as the Lord liveth, The man that hath done this thing shall surely die. We see there David's indignation was aroused, but his conscience was still asleep. Hence condemnation for others, exoneration for himself. Righteous indignation coupled with self-indulgence all the while failing to realise that the Lord was actually speaking to him. Brethren, we need need to be conscious of when the Lord is actually speaking to us. Though for a lengthy period of time David remained impenitent, the Lord, as we saw in 2 Samuel the Lord, through Nathan the prophet, had brought him to the acknowledgement and confession of his sins. What a mercy. That was unquestionably, of course, the doing of the Lord. Through Nathan and through the story that he told of the poor man and his only lamb, the Lord brought David to a conscious realisation of his sins. It was the Lord who convicted David of his sins and caused him to sorrow and grieve over those sins. Uh, Left to himself, uh, David would have continued on in his impenitence. And brethren, that's true of us. Left to ourselves, we will continue on in our impenitence as well. Uh, David needed to be arrested by the Lord. We need to be arrested also uh, by the Lord concerning our sins. Left to himself, despite the gravity of his sins, David would never have acknowledged them. But the Lord, in his grace and mercy, and it was in his grace and mercy, the Lord in his grace and mercy refused to allow David to continue on impenitently. 
David needed to face his sins. He needed to see them for what they were. A very clear indication of the scripture here is that the Lord pursued him. The Lord pursued his servant. The Lord pursued his king. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long, says David. What happened when uh, David kept silence? What happened to him when he remained impenitent? Well, the indication here is that his physical strength began to fail. His life became a burden. and The effect of God's hand against him was so great that he was led to cry out in anguish. His ability to function normally was uh, gradually being taken away. and The result was his soul became deeply troubled. Verse 4, we read, For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. The hand of God was heavy upon him. The Lord did not allow him to rest comfortably in the midst of his sin. But the heavy hand of the Lord came upon him. And even in the night the Lord afforded him no rest. Day and night the Lord pressed him. There was no escape. David could find no relief. The remembrance of his sins troubled him. The Lord was at work in the life of David. The result was, as we read in verse 4 also, his moisture was turned into the drought of summer. The description there takes up the idea of a plant in the middle of the summer. David was like that plant in the middle of the summer when there is no rain, so the sap in the plant dries up, with the result that the plant gradually withers, strength and vitality fades away and so too with David all his strength and his vitality wasted away life was hard physically hard but also spiritually and psychologically debilitating the Lord removed from David the assurance of his favour and blessing and the Lord does not allow his people simply to rest content in their sins that should be our prayer too Lord, Lord don't allow me and to rest content in my sins. Enliven me, awaken me to the reality of my sins. Cause me to face them, to address them, to deal with them, and to turn from them. Now that might seem a strange prayer in a certain sense because that has implications for all of us and we may not altogether like the implications. But the alternative is to be left in our sins and just simply go on unrepentant in our sins. In the case of David, as a result of what the Lord was doing in his life, he uh, was deprived of the uh, conscious nearness and the presence of the Lord. The intimate communion that he had previously experienced withered away. He no longer enjoyed warm fellowship and communion with the Lord. The Lord seemed far removed, as though the Lord did not hear when he spoke. In place of the Lord's nearness and presence came a sense of the Lord's anger and disapproval. And so his life became one of spiritual destitution. Painful. Painful. But as painful as that experience was, it was of the Lord's mercy. The most devastating thing that the Lord can do to any of us would be to allow us to go on in our sins so that we become comfortable in those sins and we refuse to address them. We might feel more comfortable in that situation where there's no disturbance of our consciences, where we're oblivious to our sins. But that is a highly dangerous spiritual state. Thankfully for David, the Lord did not leave him to his silence. And thankfully the Lord does not allow us to continue in silence such as his mercy and grace.
That's one of the benefits that the Lord actually bestows upon us. We might not always think it a benefit, but it is a benefit. The Lord does not allow us, by his grace, to just simply rest in the midst of our sins. Under the Lord's hand, David was brought to acknowledge and confess his sins. So we read in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. The changed and spiritually renewed David uh, speaks there in verse 5. Here we are, we are directed to the essential features of true confession of sin. Notice firstly, David acknowledged his sin. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. David no longer attempts to pretend that he has, has not sinned. He does not seek to justify his sins nor to excuse his conduct. Rather, he openly owns his sins. He takes full responsibility for those sins. He lays the blame where it belongs. He owns his sins. And that, brethren, is what we need to do as regards our sins. Notice the use of the first person pronouns uh, there. I, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. That in the first place. Uh, furthermore, uh, David also recognised that by his sins he had actually sinned against the Lord. Uh, we saw that in that uh, passage in Second Samuel 12 where he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And that ought to be the concern of every penitent sinner. That ought to be our concern, brethren. Not only uh, do we sin against one another, but at the very heart of every sin is our sin against the Lord. It's true that David certainly sinned against Bathsheba. He also sinned against Uriah. He sinned even against the people of God. But David came to see the most serious aspect of his sin, and that was that he had offended against the Lord himself. His sins were in fact an attack upon the Lord himself and upon his honour and upon his glory. His actions were destructive of the name and the reputation of the Lord. We also need to appreciate that that is the nature of sin. And then finally, as regards confession, David was also brought to the place where he was specific about his sins. And sometimes we are content with the general acknowledgement and confession of our sins. Uh, but here David is brought to a specific acknowledgement of his sins. We read there in verse 5, I will confess my transgressions. What's interesting there, that word translated from the Hebrew confess literally means to point the finger at, to point the finger at. Uh, David not only pointed the finger at himself, but he also pointed the finger at his specific sins. He acknowledged his specific sins and we also need to do the same. It's not wrong to engage in general confession of sin. Uh, it's right to do that. But we also must not just simply rest in general confession of sin. Uh, we need actually to point the finger at our own sins, to identify those sins, to turn our minds to those sins and the, and the implications of those sins and to make confession of those specific sins. I to consider the specific details of our sins actually tends to lead to a glossing over of our sins. We, we pray the prayer, Lord, uh, forgive me for my sins. Uh, but if we don't turn our minds to our sins, uh, then the reality is that that can become a very trite uh, prayer. Notice the beautiful and comforting conclusion 
of verse 5. After David comes to the place where he confesses his sins, acknowledges his sins, we read, And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness with the Lord. There was forgiveness uh, for David. David, king of Israel. David, the uh, friend of God. David, the adulterer. David, the murderer. On David's acknowledgement and confession of his sins, uh, the Lord in his mercy and grace, forgave the iniquity of his sins. Hence the opening words of the psalm, blessed, blessed, happy is he whose transgression is, is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Impliedly, of course, brethren, when we say blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered, it also applies that uh, if our sins are not forgiven and if our sins are not covered, we're not blessed. In the way of confession came the knowledge and experience of forgiveness. The Lord heard David's confession and he gave him to know that his sins were forgiven, they were put away. What, what a blessed thing that is. What a blessed thing it is to know that our sins, great though they may be, that those sins have actually been forgiven. In the way of his confession, David was restored uh, to God's favour and blessing. Brother, you want to experience God's favour and blessing, uh, pay attention uh, to your sin. Pay attention to the confession of your sins. Pay attention to the turning away from your sins. You see, we, we often think that we can just simply go on blithely in our sins and it won't matter. But we don't actually recognise when we do that that little by little often the Lord is actually withdrawing from us uh, the uh, benefits and the blessings of our salvation. And so our Christian life becomes poverty stricken uh, it doesn't have that joy and that hope uh, that uh, once we knew a bit like the um, a bit like the uh, frog in the boiling uh, pot of water you know, we don't know in fact that we're actually being essentially cooked alive When we refuse to confess our sins, we experience alienation from God. There is an absence of peace as between our souls and the Lord. And apart from genuine confession of sins, uh, we will never know uh, that peace. We'll never enjoy that peace. We won't know and experience the benefit and blessing of forgiveness either. What's the message here for us, brethren? It's this, let us humble ourselves. Let us confess our sins. And in that way, let us experience the restoration of God's favour and blessing upon us. Now, it was only when David confessed his sins that the Lord forgave him for those sins. It was only then that the Lord assured David that his sins had been blotted out and put away. Without confession of our sins, we will never know the comfort of forgiveness. We will never know the blessing of peace with God. We will actually never know that all is well as between our souls and the Lord. Remember that uh, promise of uh, the Lord that we actually read this morning in 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then no one will ever be refused the forgiveness of their sins uh, who truly confesses their sin. If the Lord could forgive David, he is certainly able to forgive you and me. Finally, 
it should be noted that David's confession was not the reason or ground of God's forgiveness of his sins. Uh, to put it another way, his confession uh, did not merit forgiveness. And the truth is our confession uh, does not merit our forgiveness. Remember, it was the Lord who brought David to confess his sins. It was the Lord who sent Nathan. David's confession was the God-ordained way of his forgiveness. The Lord caused David to confess his sins in order that he might know forgiveness. Without confession of his sins, without the intervention of the Lord, David would never have known forgiveness. And that's the, that's the truth also, brethren, for every believer. Confession of sin is a glorious work of God's grace in us. Brethren, pray that the Lord would so work in your heart and work in the heart of our congregation that individually and collectively uh, we would confess our sins. We're all sinners. This is not a message that belongs to everybody else and not to ourselves. We're all sinners. And like David, we have transgressed the law of God. And you might say, well, I haven't transgressed the law of God in the same way as did David. But the reality, is, brethren, is we're all sinners. In fact, the truth is we're all great sinners, great sinners. And we all need to confess our sins. May we with David say, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. What a blessing to be able to pray that prayer. What a relief. And then with David, as we pray that prayer, we will be able to say, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Amen. Let's uh, stand uh, for a brief word of prayer. Lord, we uh, cannot deny that each of us are sinners. Sometimes we might like to conceive of ourselves as not being, in fact, great sinners, Really, all our sins are just uh, little sins, small sins, sins not of uh, great moment or consequence. Uh, if we say that, uh, we deceive ourselves. And the truth, in fact, is not in us. Uh, we are sinners, great sinners, sinners who stand in need of uh, confession, sinners who stand in need of repentance, and so, Lord, our prayer is that uh, this word of God would actually speak to our hearts even this evening, that uh, we would uh, consciously search our hearts uh, to consider our sins, uh, whether we consider them to be small or great, and let us be those that confess our sins unto thee, turning from those sins, so that in that way, uh, we might know that uh, genuine uh, peace that comes uh, from the knowledge that our sins are forgiven. So, Lord, uh, speak to our hearts uh, through thy word, and this we pray for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.